Well, good morning to each one this morning. Yes, it is Father's Day, and as we heard already, happy Father's Day. Like we all know, we're all entitled to our opinion, two opinions here. Fathers have five responsibilities, a responsibility to lead, a responsibility to seek God's will, a responsibility to pray and worship, a responsibility to protect the innocent and the good, a responsibility to provide for those we love and lead. And while we can think about that and ponder those responsibilities, results, that's not a bad idea, although I think we all would agree that that's part. That summarizes the rule to a certain degree, but uh, it extends past that many times. Someone else also listed five duties of a father to his children. Live your wife a life worth imitating. And we're going to look a little bit at that a little bit later on here this morning. Love their mother, discipline your children, love your children unconditionally, and follow the only perfect father. Another good list as we think of uh, fathers and their responsibility and rule in the home, one to take seriously. You know, we think about following the only perfect father, and that ties in well with the idea of living a life worth imitating. And when we, when we follow our Heavenly Father, and when we imitate Him, it's only then that we're going to have lives that will be worth imitating, and we will be the kind of fathers that God has called us to be. Jesus is often referred to as our perfect example. The one that we can follow, and we, when we are following him, we know that we're on the right path, and we're living in absolute obedience. Back in Genesis, we're told that we were made in the image or in the likeness of God. And I trust this morning, each one of here, us this morning, are trying to become more and more like Christ. And to do that, we're going to follow his footsteps and try to imitate his actions. And this morning... We're going to look at at six of the virtues of Christ and see if our character is in line with his example. And I was sitting here earlier this morning, and I'm looking around like, yeah, there's a lot of people here this morning who are not fathers. But as Christians, I trust that our, our goal and our desire is to follow Christ. So while this morning the subject is going to be a lot on dads and fathers, I trust that we can take the six virtues of Christ and apply them to our lives, whether you are a father or a mother, or I was thinking about the youth this morning. They're like, oh boy, here we go again. Well, just take the six virtues of, that we're going to look at from Christ and just apply it to your life, regardless where you're at in life. I trust it can be a time of growing, a time of encouragement for each one here this morning. So if we want to be like Christ, we will need to, and there are six B's we're going to talk about, and my dear friend Steve nailed my first one right home. He talked about the first one. And so we got a good introduction. When your son uh, finds a paint bucket, be compassionate. Number one is be compassionate. Got to talk to Steve sometime. I wonder what color that was that he was putting on the front porch and on the doors. We'll talk about that later. Jesus was compassionate. Mark 6. 34, and you're welcome to turn there. Like I said, i got six points. I'm going to be jumping around a good bit. Uh, you're welcome to turn to them or, or write them down. But we think about being compassionate. Uh, if we would ask about, you know, what's some of the, the good character traits of Jesus? I think some of the first ones, one of the first ones that would probably come to mind would be compassionate. And another one was a number of them that hopefully we can look at the ones that you're thinking about. But Mark 6:34. And this is the account where uh, Jesus was, he fed the 5,000. But prior to that, it says, and Jesus, in verse 34 of Mark 6, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion towards them, because they were a sheep not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. What is compassion? Steve gave a good description already. Sympathetic, sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or sorrows of others. So how can we be compassionate in our homes? How can we take Jesus' example of compassion and apply it in our everyday lives? We need to be aware of the needs in our families. And as you see here 
In this verse, Jesus taught them, and we need to teach our families as well. So Jesus was aware of the people around him. Jesus took time to go to them, and he said, teach them many things. Why? Because they were like a flock of sheep with no shepherd to direct them. So this may not be the picture in your home, but notice what Jesus brought to the scene. And we could say, oh, it was food. Correct. But there was a little bit more. What I'd like to look at this morning is how Jesus brought stability through compassion. So there were 5,000 people there, 5,000 men, I do believe, plus uh, women and children. And, and Jesus saw them as, as, a, as a scattered folk, and he brought stability through compassion. Dad, as the leader of the home, are you bringing stability to the home setting? And as Steve mentioned already, you are the key person in keeping order in your home. And it's kind of like keeping order in a home is kind of like included in your job description. I think it was, yeah, it was this week. Uh, someone said something in our home that was intended to pick on Dad. And uh, a comment was made, oh, we're uh, something about picking on Dad again. And one of my daughters, I have three, so I'm not going to say which one, he made the, she made the comment, well, being picked on is just part of your job description, Dad. And I'm not sure if her job description book she was referring to, if she was reading a book, but she thought such an action was included. Dad, we're not called to lord over our families, nor are we to demand obedience. Rather, bring stability through compassion. As the leader of the home, Dad, we need to be alert. We need to be aware of the surroundings and efficiently keep order. Dad leads out in prayer time, in prayer at mealtimes, or sometimes I'll ask for my family members to lead out. Dad leads out there. Dad leads out in family devotions. Dad makes sure family gets to church. Thank you, Dad. You're here this morning. Dad makes sure the family gets other planned activities. He takes care of the household chores that requires his strength and ability. Dad is a man of the word and instructs the family with the word. Dad, do, do your children know that Dad loves the word and that he leads the family in truth? While it's often Mom who's at home during the day, keeping things going, the home requires Dad to be there after work to bring stability. I ask some questions. Are we leading with compassion? And are we taking our responsibility seriously? Picture a, a frantic flock of sheep out running around, running here and there, trying to find green grass and trying to find a place for water. And then picture another flock of sheep calmly following the shep shepherd to the slopes with the lush grass and then on to the gentle stream with the clear water for a refreshing drink. And then you see there, that's God's plan for the family. Dad, calmly leading the family and their wife in the correct direction and eventually on to their eternal home. So we look to Jesus as a supreme example. And then we have Dad imitating Jesus. And then we have the children imitating Dad. And from that, the godly generations keep coming. While there will be days that could be described better as chaos and confusion... Trust me, I think we'd all been there. Dad, you need to sort through it all and bring peace and calm the waters. So point number one, lead with compassion. Number two, as Christ was, we need to be forgiving. Number two, be forgiving. And this requires forgiving others as well as being able to ask for forgiveness for a mistake that we made. As we see, forgiveness is a two-way street. Luke 23, 34 and here we're in the crucifixion account, and Jesus is being nailed to the cross. In verse 34, he said, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And what Jesus here is doing, he's showing us an example of a forgiving attitude during a time, well, I would like to say, it would have been the hardest to forgive. Think of where he was at at this time and how, think of how hard it would have been to say, forgive them, as they were driving them nails through his hands and through his feet. He seems to feel the, I quote, he seemed to feel the injury they did to their own soul more than the wounds they gave him, as if it were to forget his own anguish out of a concern for their salvation. 
what Jesus did, he showed us the example of forgiveness above all others. But then he's asking us that we're supposed to follow his example. We're supposed to imitate him and follow in his footsteps. And we need to be forgiving. Fathers and mothers, husbands and wives, there will be times of miscommunications. There will be times of disappointments. Why? Because we're human. However, we need to be a forgiving people. To forgive is to stop feeling angry or resentful towards someone for an, offense, for an offense, flaw, miscommunication, or a mistake. And Jesus, as, his, as our example, he's showing us, and he showed us clearly here in Luke how, how to forgive, and we need to be forgiven as well. Dad, be quick to forgive. Take the leadership role on this subject. And it's important for a number of reasons, but close to the top of the list is that you're being watched by your children, you are their hero, and you are their reflection of Jesus Christ. So your children are going to imitate you. We need to be careful and be quick to forgive and to ask for forgiveness. So definitely something we need to, a rule we need to apply directly in our homes each and every day. When we do something selfishly, it makes us feel unclean and sad. Then along with that thought, try to imagine if you or I were one of Joseph's brothers that sold him into Egypt. Why did they do it? Think about the guilt they endured and the lies they had to tell to cover their mistake. They lied to their father time and time again. But Joseph was gone. They didn't know where he was. They couldn't go back to him and ask for forgiveness and correct their error. So what happened? They, they endured an extreme heavy burden on their shoulders for many years. But was it worth it? Absolutely not. The Bible says, forgive and ye shall be forgiven. And a quote I found, every dad is a rule, is a, the family rule model, whether he wants the job or not. Sounds kind of blunt, but dad, part of your, fa- of your job description, you are the rule model. People look, your children and your family looks to you. Are we leading them in the correct way? Are you a forgiving dad? following the rule of Jesus and setting the example in your home. It's been said a father's rule, words are like the thermostat that sets the temperature in their home. You ever look at it that way? Dad, your words are like a thermostat. So a kind and caring and compassionate words are like heat in the summer and air conditioning, heat in the winter and air conditioning in the summer. Let me get that straight. Is that how we are in our homes? So dad, be forgiving. The third point is be a man of prayer. Uh, we're in Luke, back here in Luke, uh, Luke 6, 12. We, we can read about Jesus. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night to, in prayer to God. I recognize the, the plate of a father is full. That's, we understand that. Providing for our families takes time. Uh, a lot of time, and it seems like some days there's just not enough of hours in the day. But Dad, you need to have pro- your priorities in line. You need to have your priorities in line. So maybe coffee is close to the top of the list of your must-haves, of your morning must-have. But I believe that prayer needs to be far above that yet. Please don't leave home without spending time alone with God. Well, I overslept. Skip breakfast. But don't skip your time with the Lord. And maybe some of you men have your devotions in the evening. That's fine. But I still like to encourage you, before you leave the house, take time alone with God. Many times we can read in Scripture how Jesus headed to a mountaintop to pray, as we see here in Luke. And while that's not, that is a great idea, dads, we need to have a place in our homes where we commit the day to the Lord, into the Lord's hands, asking for his wisdom, his direction, and his protection. Every day, dad, you need to take time for the Lord. A number of quotes, and only a few I have who quoted them, but prayer is a shield to the soul. The greatest tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. 
the best and sweetest flowers of paradise God gives to his people when they are upon their knees. Prayer is the gate of heaven. Prayer is opening the door to our heart, giving Jesus access to our needs, and permitting him to exercise his own power in dealing with them. Jonathan Edwards, prayer is as natural an expression of faith as breathing is of life. If we stop breathing, we're going to die spiritually. If we stop praying according to that, we lack faith and we will die spiritually. Spurgeon says, I am sure we cannot expect our children to grow up a godly seed if there is no family prayer. I trust that we all have spend time praying with our families. A very familiar quote, a family that prays together stays together. I ask, Dad, are we spending quality time in prayer with the Lord? Point number four, be gentle. We know how, again, following the example of Christ, there were certainly were times when Jesus used stern words, but he knew when gentleness was appropriate. We read in the, in the New Testament how children love coming to Jesus. And there were times he had to rebuke his disciples and says, Forbid them not, allow them to come unto me. When speaking with his disciples or his mother or others as well, he could be very gent- kind-hearted and gentle. So as we're thinking to uh, becoming more like Christ, the book of James gives us some, uh, some instruction. Um, James 3.17, speaking of wisdom, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, then he uses the word a gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So speaking of heavenly wisdom, does this verse describe us? Think about it, fathers. Pure, undefiled, peaceable, one who delights in peace. Are we gentle, which is to be considerate, to be kind, to be forbearing? It speaks of a conduct which is courteous and reasonable. A gentle person is warm and friendly. Are we fitting the description we see here? And then James adds, easy to be entreated. And although it's not, he didn't say, it, it's after, listed after gentle, but think about that. Willing to yield. And as we mentioned earlier, the, where dad brings to building order to the home, but we are to maintain this order with gentleness. Dad, are we gentle? There are times where it's a challenge, but are we gentle? Galatians 5, here with the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering. We could go over all them, but I picked out gentleness. And the rest are goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And some information I found on gentleness. A disposition to be pleased. It's a mildness of temper. It's a calmness of spirit, an unruffled disposition, and a disposition that treats all with politeness. Dad, Jesus was gentle. We're to put to follow in his footsteps. This takes our job description, if you can, to a, a new level. And coming from the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness is one of the regular effects of the Spirit's operations of the heart. How, you know, how we're changed from within. This gentleness sweetens the temper, corrects the irritable disposition, makes the heart kind, disposes us to make all around us as happy as possible. What kind of people are we? And that's the true politeness, the kind of politeness that can be learned in the school of Christ. Again, going back to Genesis, we're made in his likeness, then going back to become more like Jesus Christ, we take on his character and apply it. Second Timothy 2.24, I understand it's talking about the minister, but I, I think it applies to all. The servant, we're all servants. Servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. And may we add, being gentle with our family. In the world today, I think many are focused on their rights 
Many today refuse to come under any kind of authority. And the idea of being a gentle, gentle comes across as a sign of weakness. And so many look at this and say, not going there. And also it goes against the image of manhood, which is hard in our society today. But as Christians, as we follow Christ's example, we recognize that gentleness as a positive approved action in the eyes of the Lord. And to be more like him, we become gentle. As children ran to the arms of Jesus, the gentle arms of Christ, so our children need to feel comfortable and welcome to come to Dad for words of advice, comfort, or just to sit and talk. Gentlemen, be gentle. Point number five, be patient. Definition. Able to accept or tolerate delays, problems, or suffering without becoming annoyed or anxious. And may I add, it's easier to say that than to do that sometimes. Not a definition that's easy to follow, but what I'm sure many of you have mastered quite well. This means that when you are in a traffic jam, or maybe for the women, if you're behind a slowly moving cart that happens to be in the center of the aisle in the grocery store, we don't become anxious. It would be nice to ask you to stand if you have mastered that one, but I'm not going to go there. But sometimes it's very difficult. But we're supposed to be patient. Patient also has the idea of being steadfast and enduring. So think back a little bit. Remember how patient Jesus was with us prior to our conversion experience. He didn't just say, no hope, and cast out. Remember how patient he was there? Remember how patient, think about how patient Jesus is with us today when we slip or fall or make a mistake. Maybe the same mistake that we made yesterday. Then we're talking about fathers and children. This will help us remember that children are not perfect either, and we need to be patient with them. When my children do something, I, I decided to use the word unique. And you can define that as you wish, but the word unique, when they do something like that, it helps me when I remind myself, you know what, I was young one time as well, and then we can patiently allow our children to grow. And no, that does not include overlooking sin or anything like that, but sometimes it's like, oh, well, I was young too. We need to be patient. Patience is a virtue that we need to work on each and every day. How do we attain patience? Does it come by default as we get older? The book of James here again, James 1, 2 to 4. My brother encountered all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And by them verses, we understand God's purpose in testing our faith. God doesn't promise us perpetual health, great wealth, and smooth pathway. The trying of our faith works or brings about more patience. And patience is a quality that God uses to make us mature and complete. And he tests us and tries us so we become more patient. We're to rejoice in times of trial. For the blood, sweat, and tears of the Christian life are for a purpose. It's not a mistake. It's for a purpose. And they are the means by which we can grow in the likeness of God. A father lost his temper one morning in one of those irritating situations that tend to happen in life and unleashed his frustration and anger to his son, which happened to be the closest target. Later on in the day, while he and his son were fishing, he became convicted about what he had said and done. He began, uh, son, I was a little impatient this morning. Uh-huh. The son grunted as he reeled in his line and prepared to cast again. The father continued, uh, I realized that was a little hard to be around. Again, uh-huh, was the only response the son made. The father continued, I, I want you to know that uh, I feel bad about that. Then quickly to justify himself, he added, but you know, son, there are times that I'm like that. The boy merely said, uh-huh. A few seconds passed, and the boy added, you know, Dad, God uses you to teach patience to the rest 
of the family. You know, sometimes it's our own family to have a way of, of nailing us with their honesty. But rather than feeling hammered, let's take what they say as good advice. And few can help us to grow more in the likeness of Christ than some of our own family members. Dad, pray for patience, asking God for wisdom and direction. Why? Because impatience causes unkind words to slip, which quickly leads to regret and strained relationships. Lord, help us to be patient. And point number six is be humble. In Isaiah 53, we can read a chapter how Christ was humble, read about his humility. And in, in Philippians, which Jim covered quite well, in recent messages in Philippians 2, verses 3 to 5, it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, that we had that servant again, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You know, while we look to grow more in the likeness of Christ, we get to the subject of humility. And it is in, in Jesus Christ where we find the greatest example to follow in understanding true humility. And as we adopt his attitude into our own lives, it has been said the virtue most emphasized by Jesus Christ was a quality of humility. And we can go and search scriptures uh, on pride and humility, and we will find numerous. Humility, free from pride or arrogance, the quality or state of being humble. C.S. Lewis, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. Fathers, as we lead, as we direct, as we're the role model, as our children imitate us, are we passing this trait on to our children we're not to think that we're better than others. Why? Because for the Christian, all that we have is a benefit of belonging to Christ. And I thought that hit the nail on the head. What we have, we can't think that we are something, and that we've attained a lot, and our material possessions are because of us. No, it says all that we have is a benefit of belonging to Christ. That puts the praise and honor and glory back to Jesus Christ for what? For where we are. So we hold others better than our, we are to hold others better than we are and going beyond us in all ways. There's an old saying, when you see a turtle on top of a fence post, you know he didn't get there by himself. And when we are in Christ, we understand that we didn't get to that state by ourselves. So we have nothing to exalt before others except what we have in Christ. But here, as you see in Philippians, Jesus is our example. He emptied himself. He who had the greatest reputation and honor put it all aside, set that glory aside, all along with his privileges, and be, as the Son of God, and he said it came to earth. He gave up his position and became, as we see here, a servant. Then he became like one of us to die as one of us. He unselfishly gave his life. No pride, no recognition needed here at all. Jesus laid down his life in pure humility for you and I. He was obedient, always obedient. Humility before God results in obedience to God. Humility before God results in obedience to God. And I trust fathers, dads, that's where we are at, obedient to God in pure humility. Martin Luther told of a story about two mountain goats that met each other on a narrow ledge that was only wide enough for one animal to pass. So we have two goats head on. On one side was a sheer cliff going down, and the other side was a steep wall going 
up. So the two were facing each other. It was impossible to turn around or back up. How were they going to work through their situation? According to Luther, the one goat lay down the trail and let the other literally walk over him. And they continued on their way, and they both were safe. Yes, I understand, and will not. And above all, Jesus Christ was our su- supreme example of humility. But please allow these two little goats to drive home a point on humility as well. Are we going to stand up? What if they would start button heads and, and started carrying on and refusing to give in? One probably would have fell. But what they did, one laid down, let the other one literally walk over him. In the May and June edition of the, the, the Key MF Messenger, which most of you might, might have read, Frank Reed wrote a, a topic titled, Dear Dad. And it, just a, a few sentences from there. He starts with a question, where are you? And towards the end he says, your children are such amazing people. They love you, and I know that you love them. But where are you? Dad, they need you. Again, he asks, where are you? At the end there he says, to all the committed, engaged dads out there, God bless you. So if I can take Frank's words and pass it on, you're raising a generation of children prepared to face life. And then, as if writing to Myerstown, he says, to all the young dads just getting started, it's a number of you here this morning that fit the description, God bless you. The wonder of fathering is awaiting you. Bless your children no matter the cost. Responsibility to each one of us. From Malachi 4, 5, and 6, God sends prophets to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest God should come and smite the earth with a curse. I close with, fathers, be compassionate, be forgiving, be men of prayer, be gentle, be patient, and be humble. And when you do that, you will be the father that God wants you to be and intended for you to be. So God bless you throughout the day and throughout the week and the years to come. You can take the example of Christ, apply it to your heart and lives, and live in a way that he has called us to. to. Let's pause for prayer. Father God, we come before you this morning. We're just thankful for the example of Jesus Christ and for the virtues that he showed us. I pray, God, that we can take our rule as a father seriously, and each one of us can take the virtues we saw from Christ and apply them to our lives so we can be men and women that you have called us to be. Give us wisdom and direction, and Lord, help us all to be people of prayer and lifting our situation to the throne room each and every day of our lives and just looking to you for wisdom and direction. Be with us as dads as we lead and direct our families. We again pray for wisdom and understanding. Help us, Lord, to be compassionate and, Lord, just to be the gentleman that you have called us to be. In the name of Jesus, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Philip, you have a song that you can lead us in. Stand for the song and follow the song you consider yourselves dismissed.